In the bullpen today, we have an update. Remember the story that we covered about a college student, Mr. Judah Atkins, at the University of Southern California. Well, Mr. Atkins was arrested for a crime he never committed. He was arrested for armed robbery. He never did any of this. He ends up going to jail, stays in jail way longer than he should have. They don't allow him to make a phone call initially, stays in jail. But guess what? He gets adjudicated. Uh, it is obvious he's not the person. No problem. But see, in the midst of this, the school decided to expel him. He gets adjudicated. He didn't do it. School should update. They never should have taken him off the roster anyway. But they did not provide that opportunity for him to come back to the institution, even though he was a victim of the criminal justice system. The institution decided to victimize him a second time. We have Mr. Atkins on the show. Good day, sir. Wish it was under better circumstances. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Dr. Richie. It's a pleasure to be here. Sir, I would like for you to tell us in your own words what happened that night you were arrested or that day you were arrested and the experience and then the response from your university. Uh, that night just is always going to just be a very vivid picture in my mind. It was the last day of my freshman year. Class had just ended, and I went with my friend Tomas Menea, my other friend um, Arjun, to the SC Choreographic Showcase, which is just like, you know, a ballet recital for some of the dancers in the in the uh, Kaufman School of Dance here. And we just saw like one of our mutual friends. Saw him, um, as you saw in the store, I had my own receipt and also witnesses to say I was there during the time that the, the alleged crime happened. And then after just um, when I saw my friends, saw some more friends later that night. And um, after that, while walking home, I was just stopped by, or actually I first noticed a helicopter light just over me while I'm walking home. And then officers just start just coming and piling up the street. And I'm just walking by and they just a few officers come up to me and just like um, stop and detain me with few words. They just are like, stop. Um, and soon after that, I'm just like, you know, I'm walking back home, a USC student. And moments after they have they have me, you know, putting my hands in their car, asking for fingerprints, being handcuffed. And after that just goes into the whole, you know, live events that happen after. Wow. OK, so you get arrested. They're not telling you all of the de details at this point, right? Okay. Um, you go to the precinct or you go to the jail. Yes. Sir. Tell, tell me about you not receiving your phone call immediately and also them basically denying your uh, opportunity to simply eat food uh, yes, to, to stay alive. Tell us about that experience. Well, first, before that, um, when you first enter in jail, you're held in a holding tank to be processed just throughout. And you're just being like just sifted through just like hundreds of people going in and out of this one cell that I was in for about 24 hours, just being held there, no food, no calls, no anything, just like in complete, just like shock. And then after that, I'm transferred to um, another cell with a few other cellmates, which is just like a probably like four by four foot so and there i'm just like there's like absolutely no one no officers for at least a day and then when i finally do see one i'm, I'm just asking can i get a phone call meals anything and they uh, withhold phone calls for about four days i ask why and there's absolutely no response they just treat you like you know a machine another robot in their system it's another cog in the system and the meals that they give, they give one for breakfast and one for dinner. It was absolutely just disgusting. Burnt, just like burnt everything, burnt peas, corn, like absolutely an edible meal. So I was probably surviving off 200, 300 calories per day for those first like four or five days, while also just being transferred out and sifted between like cells and holding tanks. Wow. Um, when you finally are able to make a phone call, because your friends don't know what has happened here. Um, your uh, parents, uh, they don't know what's going on with you. You are, uh, you just finished your uh, semester and all of a sudden you disappear. On day four, you get a phone call. What happened? 
on day four, I get a phone call. I call out to my mom, my dad, my friends that are with me. I reach out to Tomas. And um, he was the only person who actually came, well, aside from my parents, obviously, who actually came to see me. And at that point, I was like, oh, like, this is going to get dropped. Like, hopefully, like, I know that I haven't done anything wrong. And he's being really supportive. Tomas is one of my best friends I have, I've ever had in my entire life. He's there for me. He's saying, you know, you're going to get through this. This is before my arraignment. So I have a little bit more hope that, like, oh, this day has got the wrong person. Like, nothing bad is going to happen. Like, I'll be out of here. I have like a 10 minute um, call with Tomas and then I get a visit with him, like a five minute in-person visit because he also is staying back for me because he's supposed to be going back um, home to Connecticut, but he stayed there for me just while I was um, in jail for this time. And uh, I finally get to the actual arraignment itself. And that's where I just hear the prosecutors just like go off about what I allegedly did saying I robbed this car that I broke in with a gun, et cetera, et cetera. And they raised the bail to $150,000. And that's when it fully sets in. That's like, wow, like my life is actually over. You spent two weeks in the LA County Jail. Uh, you have this enhanced bond. There's virtually zero evidence saying you did this crime. Here are the connectors. What did they say was the reason they targeted you and arrested you specifically for a crime you never committed? Well, there's a lot of factors that go into it, but at first they said that the victim um, themselves identified me, identified me in a lineup of people that had been um, allegedly around the crime scene, which first of all, I'd never even been around the crime scene because the crime scene was in downtown LA, nearly um, five miles away, if not more, while I'm back at USC's main campus or near USC's main campus. And then after the prosecutors just went off about how I'm the one who had a gun, a lot of shotgun actually robbing a car itself. I had a bag with cell phones and a bunch of other robbing, uh, a bunch of other stolen goods. And one of the only reasons that I was even able to um, get indicted and have reconnaissance as fast as I did was because I had Life360 on my phone, an app where, which tracks where you go, place to place. And I was like, if if I'm able to, you know, retain the evidence from my phone, then I'm going to be able to exonerate myself. But that in itself was a long, long process, at like post-release and also trying to convince the judge that, hey, I have the evidence on my phone, first of all. Not even aside from the fact that I'm innocent, like, you know, being innocent self, but I have like concrete evidence and I was finally able to obtain that. Uh, so at this point, you're talking to prosecutors. They're saying, we don't want to hear you. We know you did A, B, and C. You did none of that. Uh, it's almost as if any Black person would do kind of scenario. They just want to put you uh, in this in this situation and say, you're guilty. We're going to prosecute you. We have no evidence, but we're going to do it anyway. You get an enhanced bond. Um, you don't have some arrest record. You're not a convicted felon. You don't have anything that typically a court would weigh and say, this person is a flight risk. We need to make sure. Uh, that in lieu of uh, the charges and their history, we need to enhance the bond so that they come back to court. Bonds are not supposed to be prosecutorial by constitution. So now you have evidence called uh, Life 360. Life 360 tracks your every location. You could provide this information. I'm sure you're telling everyone you be trying to be uh, thinking that they're decent because you're decent. Hey, listen, there's been a big mix up here. I actually have something. Can I show it to you? What was their response to you in the judicial system when you said, I have concrete evidence via technology that if you all have access to it or I have access to it, it can prove I was never around the area you say I was in. What was their response? Well, it's just a lot of technical semantics. And this part of the issue was a lot that my mother and my father were dealing with themselves because I had a limited amount of phone calls just being... Um, in jail itself. So they once I told them that, they reached out to the prosecutors, uh, the public defender, the judge, trying to like, you know, put in the whole like motion to actually retain the evidence. So yeah, just like a lot of paperwork, a lot of just like, you know, hard work actually trying to get that, you know, put on for, you know, display at trial. But obviously the prosecutors had their own defense of just like, 
you know, like this person is like absolute the worst, like actually commit these crimes and mixing me up with, you know, a long list of people who I've never even talked to because um, I eventually realized that the actual perpetrators were high school students. I'm like, I've never even met these people at all. And just like the blatant racism of, you know, just like a lot of the prosecutors and I don't want to go after the victim themselves, but identifying me in that lineup, but, but just because of the clothes that I was wearing and the way that I look, I was like, wow. But no, recovering that evidence was a long ways to go. And even took, and we even tried to uh, go for it after I was released on reconnaissance, which is an, another like week long process that I took, plus being on the ankle monitor itself. You know, I find it ironic, um, and I said this in my initial coverage of the story, that a judge eventually lets you go on what we call a signature bond um, for armed robbery. An armed robbery charge usually does not carry a signature bond um, as a way to get out. But you go from an enhanced bond to a recognizant bond um, over a period of time. Uh, which is pretty extreme inside of the judicial ranks. But let's talk about the, the reality that you're innocent until proven guilty or innocent unless proven guilty. You're innocent the entire time. Uh, you, you're not guilty of anything. You have not been found guilty in a court of law anywhere. Let's go now to the reality of what happened while you're in jail. Your school decided to arbitrarily take action against you, uh, the University of Southern California. They took action against you. What did they do? Um, once they heard that I had been arrested, there had been so much pushback um, once my parents called out and once my friends such as Tomas Manea reached out. The, um, Tomas himself even told me that one, that they asked if I was an athlete or not. And once I said no, they immediately just like turned just like back down, put no effort into actually, wow. you know, seeing if I was innocent or not. <laughs> and then um, after they issued the suspension, which is which is what they call their interim protective measures in case a student actually does commit a crime. But for me, being an innocent person, I was just absolutely just like heartbroken because I didn't even know about this until I was um, released. So imagine just like uh, I was just released. And then the first thing I see, like as I, as I look at my phones, I'm just getting oh, you've been suspended from USC. I'm like, wow, like I've been released and I can't even go back to my normal life. So that was a months long battle, like actually showing them evidence, being in talks with people such as Darren Moko, who was an amazing help to actually gain a suspension lifted and being able to go back to school here it was just like such a toll because I was just like thinking that I was not able to go back to the place where, where I've been working for my entire life, like the past 13, 14 years of just like being in school, working, doing all the things that I've done, just like gone, just like to absolute waste. So that was a shell shock to me. You know, the uh, institution provided a statement. This is when uh, initially they were saying, hey, he's suspended. Um, we we will look at all information. We, we make decisions based on information currently available. But clearly, it was publicly available that you were innocent, right? We could see that. But still, there was no update. Why did it take them so long? And, and thankfully, you had an advocate. And your advocate, uh, what's the name of the advocate inside of the institution again? Uh, Darren Moko. OK, big ups. I, I want to bring attention to that because I, I think I'm a college professor myself. Big ups to people who advocate for students. Absolutely. Uh, so the, uh, you, you, you get an advocate. The advocate, well, there we go. The advocate works on your behalf, listens to your story, advocates. What made this so difficult to just update it quickly? And so, you know, the man's innocent. Uh, we probably should not have made this decision based on a police report anyway. I believe that one of the biggest things for USC is just their image and not being held accountable for very uh, about actions that are very bad on the USC reputation because USC works in part with like their Department of Public Services, DPS here and LAPD who are constantly in talks and having like a mess up as extreme as this is one of their students being arrested because of an alert because USC also sends out crime reports just about like things that happen in the area in efforts to protect, you know, the students and people around the area. But a lot of these reports are like really faulty and like really dense. And a lot of them will just have the race of the person and like no other facts. Like it was a black male or Hispanic male wearing this type of clothing with a very generalized weight and height. And, and reality creates more fear than it actually does like 
find a resolution to things that should be held just directly in the police's hands. And so for USC to not put up comment out just shows for that they're scared of the pushback and the, the impact the story could possibly have. Yeah, and that's why leadership should have called whoever they have as their liaison and say, I need to see this directly because I don't believe uh, one of our students did this. So before we go on record uh, doing something against the student, we need to see the evidence that you have. And they would have produced none because they had none actually against you. They probably could resolve this before it became a story as it is today. Give us the update as to what's happening now as it relates to your matriculation at the University of Southern California. Well, um, thanks to Darren Melko, I was able to get that suspension off. I am back in school. I'm about to, I'm almost, um, or past halfway through my first semester of junior year here. But there's been like absolutely no compensation or even an apology from the school itself. I've still had to deal with a lot of bills, um, tuition, also just like helping pay off um, my student loans and all the financial work that my mother and father and my friends have put into even trying to get me out, which was a big help of the GoFundMe that um, uh, my friend Daphne Yaman, who first wrote this story, put out. And it's been an amazing, um, just like turn off support so far. And uh, it means the uh, entire world to me, just like seeing how many people have like reached out to me, have done it to me, just taking a little bit of that pressure off, just like, you know, trying to pay rent and maintain a lot of things in my life. But that's been a really big help for me. But yeah, just trying to, you know, move forward more so this particularly doesn't happen to another person is like my main goal. And also trying to get my life back on track and finish out what I, you know, originally planned to do here at USC and graduate. What's your major? What are you majoring in? I'm a SEMA media studies major. Hopefully one day I want to be a director at Highline, just underrepresented voices. I have stories about um, African-American peoples and also queer communities themselves. So that means a lot to me is highlighting all, all the un, underrepresented people, especially since I have a lot of those type of people in my life. You know, I think that's a beautiful thing, brother. Um, <clears throat> sometimes life has a funny way of giving you a mess and you did nothing to deserve. It. And your message becomes the mess you got with age on it, M-E-S-S-A-G-E. -S -S -E. Over time, it becomes a great catalyst for how you transform the world. Um, I believe you are a world transformer. I think you're a game changer at the highest level. And I know you're going to finish that degree and go on to do great things. Allow this to be a motivation to your continued success, understanding that there's an experience that you've had that you'll never forget. Unfortunate, yes, but it can also be powerful when you transform that energy into something positive. Um, where's that GoFundMe? I wanna make sure we, we do the best we can to contribute even more. We got that GoFundMe? Let's Thank you, Dr. Rich. Oh, absolutely. Uh, for those who are uh, watching, uh, I want you to do the very best you can uh, to contribute to this GoFundMe. This uh, young brother should not have to spend another dime to pay for his higher education. Um, we have to support people like him in the village because I know something that you know. Judah Atkins, when he gets into the arena of management in whatever capacity that may be, he's going to do the right thing by people, right thing by people around him. So this is what leadership looks like. Um, for those who have been supportive, what would you like to say to them, Judah? I mean, it means the absolute world to me. I want to say thank you to Ben Papp and Daphne Yaman for putting this story on such a higher pedestal and having it, you know, reach how much it has so far. And to people who have done and support it absolutely means the world to me. Reach out to me absolutely anytime. I like to talk to them personally and thank them. And just hopefully the story can gain enough traction and help a lot more people. There you go. Um, very thankful for your time today. Thank you.